Good afternoon, everybody. I'm just waiting for this first slide to come up. Whoops. So we live in an extraordinary moment in history. On the one hand, we're all connected to one another. We can see each other for the first time in history. And on the other hand, we can see swirls of fear. Too many of us pulling back into convenient, cozy tribe, ideology, race, and religion. We ask ourselves whether the future will hold. We ask ourselves what the future of capitalism is. And this conference, in so, ways, so many ways, is a metaphor for the possibilities of capitalism. We see capital finding entrepreneurs that are dreaming and building incredible innovations, great possibility. And on the other hand, we know that capitalism also is increasing inequality, and it's in exacerbating the effects of climate change. So how do we reconcile it? I believe that it's to our generation to come up with new models. And in fact, this is something I've been thinking about it for my entire adult life. And it's exciting to be talking about it in Scandinavia. When we think about the best, and we've heard it from so many of the speakers already, it is this breathless innovation, this dreaming of robotics and virtual reality and driverless cars. And at the same time, if we could take that same level of genius, innovation, and focus sometimes not on small problems, like how do we find the best latte in town, but how do we get water to the 1.5 billion people on the earth who do not have access? How do we bring clean electricity to the world when two billion people are left out. That really is the challenge that we face as we think about real possibility going into the world. And certainly it was behind the founding of Acumen now 14 years ago. We have this idea that because there are entrepreneurs that are out there daring to go where markets and government have failed the poor, that we could accompany that with what we call patient capital, long-term investment capital accompanied by technical support, access to markets, a different way of measuring impact. And if we did it right, could we actually find entrepreneurial models that showed the world ways to scale real solutions that treated the poor as customers? Over the last 14 years, we've invested about $90 million in about 75 companies, and those companies have in turn raised $500 million that in turn have brought basic goods and services like healthcare, water, education, energy, to 180 million people in South Asia and Africa. These are companies like Sproxel, an entrepreneur named Ashifi Gogo, who saw that in Nigeria, 70% of all medicine is counterfeit. And so he created an app that allows you to, type, to text in the number on every unit of medicine and find out immediately whether it's counterfeit or legitimate. Or four entrepreneurs in India, who felt ashamed of a bloated billion dollar industry whereby 10 years ago, if you wanted to take your loved one to the hospital, you called a taxi. And if you were poor, you relied on a bullock cart. 90% of all people in ambulances at that time were dead. You only called an ambulance to go to the morgue. And so these entrepreneurs started out with nine ambulances, a lot of guts, and a dream, and they not only had to fight to build a model that people could have access to, but they had to fight a lot of vested interests that, frankly, were happy with the way that things were. Ten years later, however, they've got a company that serves almost half of India, has taken four million people to hospital, and serves as a model for emergency services around the world. Or Sanergy. 2.5 billion people in the world have no access to a toilet. So three individuals from MIT thought that cannot be. And they decided to focus their sights on the slums of Nairobi, where over a million and a half people live in pretty intense slums that are, are famous for what's called the flying toilet. Because the latrines that have been set up in the slums are overflowing and so unsafe, People defecate on paper in their houses, 
and they throw it into the muddy alleys in front. So the, the Synergy model is one that sells individual latrines to entrepreneurs. The waste is collected every day and then distributed and then com composted. And the big idea was whether you could take that compost, turn it into fertilizer, and commercialize it. Because at the, if you couldn't move the waste out of the slums, you weren't really solving a problem. It took five years for the company to sell 50 kilograms of this fertilizer. But last year, this year, it's moved 87 metric tons. We think we now have a model, not only for Nairobi, but for the rest of the world. This is the possibility of patient capital and entrepreneurship. But it only matters if we understand what we are measuring. Too often, we focus only on financial returns, when in fact, what we need to focus on are those social re impact returns that measure not only a person's increase in income, but even more important, their increase in freedom, in opportunity, in choice. I've learned that the opposite of poverty is not wealth, that the opposite of poverty is human dignity, and that we do not get dignity by assuming that charity will take care of the poor. We gain dignity through justice, through a more just system of capitalism. I think there's no other sector to release human energy than in the, in the, than in the ah, sorry, than in the building of energy itself. And so in 2006, we invested in our first solar company, a company called D-Light, that had uh, literally just a solar torch. And this idea that you could bring this to the poor to eradicate kerosene. 1.5 billion people in the world had to buy little bits of kerosene every day, and it's dirty, it's expensive, it's highly polluting. It was really hard at the beginning because of how expensive solar was. But over time, that company has grown to serve 50 million people. And in that time, an entire sector has grown on top of it. And Acumen has invested in different kinds of companies that couldn't have existed had those entrepreneurs not built D-Lite. We've invested in other product companies. Those product companies have led to home systems. So in 2011, Safaricom, which is Kenya's mobile banking platform, I mean, cell phone company that started a mobile banking company called M-Pesa, they made a joint venture with D-Lite so that people could pay on a daily basis, not just for a light, but to charge their cell phone, to buy other products like a radio and a television, refrigerator. That company is now the prototype for other kinds of companies like that. We've moved into mini grids and micro grids, alternative cook stoves, and we've learned to listen to the customer, such so that I now believe that there's a real revolution in solar for the poor, for the two billion, so that when we think about what it means to bring electricity to the two billion that don't have it, we don't have to be worried that the world is going to destroy itself with more global warming, but we can actually do it in a sustainable way. If you look at our investments just over the last 10 years, you'll see two things. One, we're investing much more in solar as opposed to other kinds of alternative energies, and two, in Africa, and there's good reason for this. The price of solar has gone down from $4 a watt when we first started investing in D-Lite to under a dollar today. And the rise of mobile banking, particularly in Africa, is creating an extraordinary synergy that is completely changing the game for our lowest income brothers and sisters. We want to focus on Africa for good reason as well, not only because of the plentitude of the sun, but because you've got a continent of a billion people whereby 80% of its citizens live off the grid, literally live in dark darkness. But I say to a group of investors and companies that no single company will do it alone. We have to focus this as an ecosystem because right now the big conversation globally is all about extending the grid. And a lot of that grid is being extended through fossil fuels like coal and diesel. And we believe that 
that, that an off-grid solar solution is cheaper, faster, more effective. But it will only happen if we approach these companies using this combination of patient capital and more traditional capital and partnering with NGOs and government, focusing on the three big gaps, marketing, creating awareness among the poor of what solar ever is because it's still a push market, focusing on product development and product procurement, and then finding financing because the local banks do not want to finance this nascent industry that serves people who make one or two dollars a day. But we believe that if we pull our forces together, we can prove that this is a better alternative. And not only that, that this isn't a short-term approach, this is a long-term approach, that off-grid solar can be a, a solution to the poor that we see as a destination in and of itself, that it doesn't have to be a short-term bridge that will ultimately go back to the grid, and that Africa has the chance to leapfrog the grid just as cell phones leapfrog traditional investments. But it takes a different kind of approach to how we think about capital. Now, this stuff is really difficult. All of the social entrepreneurs that are focused on making these kinds of changes have to deal with that. It's also difficult for us as investors to navigate the world of gray, as I know it is for so many of you who are trying to create real innovations. And so we built a manifesto for ourselves. It's aspirational. We don't live up to it every day, but I believe that in some ways it could be a manifesto for the kind of future capitalism that we believe the world needs. And if you would indulge me, I'll read it. It starts by standing with the poor, listening to voices unheard and recognizing potential where others see despair. It demands investing as a means, not an end, daring to go where markets have failed and aid has fallen short and makes capital work for us, not control us. It thrives on moral imagination, the humility to see the world as it is, the audacity to imagine it as it could be. It's having the ambition to learn at the edge, to wis the wisdom to admit failure, and the courage to start again. It requires patience and kindness, resilience and grit, a hard-edged hope. It has the ambition, uh, uh, sorry, hard-edged hope. It's leadership that rejects complacency, breaks through bureaucracy, challenges corruption, doing what's right, not what's easy. It's the radical idea of creating hope in a cynical world, changing the way the world tackles poverty, and building a world based on dignity. It all comes back to dignity. When I think of what success really means, it is about building organizations, companies, living in a way that releases human energy, other people's energy. And when I think of the most successful companies in which we've invested, some of them have gotten very profitable. But the ones who really are making change release energies not only in their customers, but also in the people who work in them and the people who are served. One such person is Mary, who I met a few weeks ago in, um, rural Kenya. She's the proud owner of a D-Lite, a number of D-Lite products. She's had them for four years. And she said to me that she decided a few years ago that she would become not a D-Lite agent, but an angel, because she does all of her work as a volunteer. And I said, you know, D-Lite has 10,000 distributors, Mary. Why would you do this for free? And she said, look, I'm 68 years old, and I want to contribute to my country and I, wanted to, I want to contribute to the world before I die. And I thought to myself, if all of us lived in that way, if all of us thought about what we give to the world more than what we would take as the single metric by which we lived our lives and by which we built our companies, what kind of world could we create? When I think of a generation, a hundred years from now, looking back at us at this crossroads moment of history with such unprecedented possibility that is not without its perils, I ask myself, I ask each of you, what will we do to create a world that not only makes life better for those of us who have so much access, 
but understands that we do not have dignity as a human race until every human being has dignity. So thank you.